uh, Mark chapter 9, in the, in the scripture journals, it's on page 52 uh, through 56 is where we're going to be in the blue Bibles in front of you. If you don't have a Bible with you today, I encourage you to turn over to 820 and 821, um, or if you brought your Bible with you, turn over to Mark 9 uh, in your own Bible, all right? And... Uh, and let's go. All right, so here we go. Uh, it says this in verse 2. It says, and after six days. And this is why it's going to take us a long time, because I'm going to say like three words and then talk. Uh, so after six days. So uh, six days. It's been six days since you and I were together, right? This is day seven. It's been, it's been six days since the last time we were together. And I don't know about you, but six days ago, uh, that sermon was hard. The words that Jesus had for us were difficult to handle and difficult to digest. I mean, you had Jesus looking at us and looking at the crowd that he was speaking to and, and saying, hey, I want you to live a cursed life and I want you to die a cursed man's death and I want you to be a part of a failed revolution. That's hard to hear. And hopefully you've wrestled with that over the last six days and you've reflected on what that means for you over the last six days. And, uh, and yet at the same time, uh, you know, Jesus' disciples needed some time. And, and so after six days, Jesus begins to kind of move uh, into engaging them again. And Mark uses numbers all throughout the book to kind of symbolize things. And so this could be symbolic. It could be in symbolic of uh, something that's incomplete uh, because six is a number of incompleteness um, and seven is a number of completeness, a number of perfection. Moses went through six days of preparation. Uh, there are, uh, there, it, 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 it's likely that this is the Sabbath. So it's likely the last time that he spoke to them was Sabbath and it's Sabbath again. And if we remember anything from what, what Jesus does on the Sabbath is he, is he is about helping usher in what people see and experience in eternity that Sabbath Sabbath is a picture of eternity and what eternity is going to be like where we just dwell in perfect union with God and with uh, others and rest in his presence. And, uh, and so, so it, this, this could all be why it, it, it starts with after six days. But it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. These three guys, I'm going to affectionately call them the inner three. Okay, they're Jesus' inner three. And I'm going to express why I think they were Jesus' inner three as we go today. But, but I think it's interesting that like there are three times within this gospel of Mark where these three are going to be singled out and they're going to be asked to go and be uh, with Jesus alone somewhere. The first time uh, we see it is when he heals Jairus' daughter. We've seen that already take place. This is the second time. And the third time is going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus is arrested and taken to be crucified. These three are the three that Jesus calls to himself and that he brings into kind of this inner circle. Uh, and here's, here's my theory as to why that is. It's because they were the three that needed it the most. Quite honestly, they were the three that needed him most. If you, if you know anything about this gospel, you know that the, the book of Mark is, is, is uh, probably most likely Mark writing down stories from Peter. Uh, and so Peter is actually sharing some of these things. And so throughout the book of Mark, you're going to hear uh, different things about Peter putting his foot in his mouth over and over and over and over again. He did it last week. He did it the week before last week. He's going to do it again today. Um, and so so, like it's just one of those things that Peter continually does and does and we don't we won't um, see as much of that with um, James and John although in the the next chapter we'll see maybe a, a, a small snippet of this um, but but in other gospels you will see the same thing that's why they're called the sons of thunder uh, in Luke chapter 9 Jesus faces some opposition and James and John go hey Jesus do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy those fools so I, they needed it the most, you know what I mean? Like they, just, they just needed to be with Jesus more than the rest of them, I think. And, uh, and so Jesus recognized that. But here's the other thing. I think he also knew that they had the most potential. Out of the 12, these three, they had a special gifting of leading other people. They had a special gifting of, of drawing more people to Jesus, even though they had no clue really what Jesus was all about for a really long time. And they, 
they, they had a lot of potential. And you see G, G, Peter and James and John. These, these are guys who are flagship marks of the early church and the Jesus movement throughout the first century. And so that's, that's what I think is happening here. But he calls them up onto the mountain by themselves. And he transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. I think this is interesting, Peter reflecting here on this situation and on this experience. Peter does this often. So Peter does it here in uh, this gospel of Mark, but he also, he does it in First Peter, his epistle. Um, he, he reflects on the transfiguration and just the, the glory of the moment. I mean, just think about being Peter in this moment, a guy who is just like gone from lowest of lows, Right? Like last week, he was looking face to face with Jesus, and he was like, Jesus, uh, you, you need to stop telling people you're going to die, uh, and then right, says, get behind me, Satan. I mean, he literally was just called Satan. I mean, it's like got to be the lowest point. Like if I looked at you right now and said, hey, you're Satan, you're going to be like, that was the worst day of my life, right? Uh, <laughs> but... But he goes from that to being invited into this very intimate space with Jesus and seeing something only three people get to see. And he, he, gets, he gets invited into this place of where, man, he goes from like the lowest of lows to what had to have been one of the most highest of highs of his life. And he sees just the amazing beauty of Jesus in this moment the interesting thing about it is is we get the transfiguration story in the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Mark and the gospel of Luke but we don't get the transfiguration in the gospel of John but John was at the transfiguration and so it's just kind of like baffling to think that like John would have experienced the same thing and Jesus makes such a big I mean Peter makes such a big deal about it Right? Peter makes such a big deal about it here, and he makes such a big deal about it in his epistle. And it's like, why would John not make a big deal about it? But I think, I think one of the things that uh, really stands out to me is maybe he does, and maybe we've just missed it. John um, writes the Gospel of John. He writes 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. And I want you to just turn over to Revelation chapter 1 with me or just follow along on the screen. Uh, but in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12... Uh, this is what we get from John. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were blazing like fire, his feet like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell on my or I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, "Do not be afraid." That sounds kind of like the transfiguration, right? And in in fact, it sounds way more like the transfiguration story in the book of Matthew. If you look at the book of Matthew in verse 2, it says that there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Skip down to verse 6 and 7 and it says when his disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground terrified. But then Jesus came and did what? Touched them and said, do not be afraid. Very similar to what John uh, accounts in in Revelation uh, chapter one. So these, like we we think about Revelation being like this man, like this has to be a crazy experience, a crazy vision that that John is seeing, and this is let that that's the second time he's seen it. It seems like, you know, it isn't the first time. So it's just a just a pretty interesting thing that this is what Jesus 
is doing. It says a part of this transfiguration, in verse 4 it says, There appeared with him Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Moses and Elijah. If you want to know two of the most important people in all of the Bible, if not the two most important people in the Bible other than Jesus himself, it's Moses and Elijah, in case you didn't know. Moses is this guy who God calls with, through a burning bush to go and bring his people out of captivity and set them free and walk with them through the wilderness and deliver the law. The first five books of the Old Testament are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All five are attributed to Moses and are called the Torah in, or in Hebrew, which is called the law. So Moses is synonymous with the law. And then you have Elijah, who is this great prophet. He speaks on behalf of God. He brings the words of God to the world. That's what he does. And, and he is the most famous of all the prophets, for sure. And, and, um, and so you, you see, uh, this is a way that he becomes synonymous with the prophets. Now, Jesus, when he thought of what we consider the Old Testament, he thought of it as the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. When asked what are the greatest, what's the greatest command, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets are fulfilled in this. He's saying everything that came before, everything that God desires, everything is wrapped up in the law and the prophets. And so this is a picture of everything that has come before Jesus. Everything that has been a forerunner to Jesus is right there with Jesus. That's what these two guys are representing here. And uh, it's all wrapped up in this moment. And it says they were talking. <laughs> they were talking. They were just having a conversation. And uh, in, Mark's, uh, in Mark's account of the transfiguration, we don't actually know what they're talking about. But in Luke's uh, description of it, it actually says they were talking about Jesus' departure. And Luke 9, verse 31, it says they were talking about Jesus' departure. Why would they be talking about his departure, right? Uh, well, here's, here's a couple theories that I have. They'd be talking about his departure, one, uh, because last week uh, we realized or we saw that Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to be killed and then I'm going to raise from the dead. And he said it plainly, and they didn't like what he had to say, right? And so this could be a very clear moment where, like, God, like, just brings a couple of clarifying pieces to the table, like Moses and Elijah, to reiterate what Jesus has already said so that his disciples, something might click, right? And they might go, oh, yeah, it's going to happen now. I mean, Moses and Elijah are saying it's got to happen now, you know? Like, However, I don't think that that's probably the best or most compelling argument for why uh, Moses and Elijah and Jesus are talking about his departure. I just think that it could be one of them. I think probably the most compelling argument is because even though Jesus knows what is about to happen and he knows where he is headed, like this is the moment. So you, you've seen throughout the gospel where, where Jesus has said, like, be quiet because my time has not yet come. I think this is the moment where, where God is, is, is saying, the time is now. Like, your time has not yet come, but the time is now. Turn your face toward Jerusalem and start going in that direction. And even though Jesus knows what's getting ready to happen, just because he knows doesn't mean it's going to be easy. <laughs> doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? I mean, Jesus in the garden, he says, God, if you will, please take this cup from me. Right? So we know this was hard for Jesus. We know this was difficult for Jesus. And knowing what God wants doesn't change the fact that it isn't complicated or isn't hard. Right? Last week we talked about this idea of picking up our cross and following Jesus. The cool thing about that was I was able to have a few conversations through email and text message and even in person with some folks about what does that really mean and how do we really live that out and, and so forth and so on, which I love. I love that. I love it when like something that I say continues on into a further conversation, gets people thinking. Like that's, that's really a lot of fun. So welcome the emails, welcome the text messages, welcome the, the coffees and conversations around the table. But, but here's, the, here's the thing that I think is really interesting. I said last week, I said I don't think the crosses that we bear are, are things like even diagnoses that were given, right? Let's say that you're diagnosed with cancer. I don't think that that's the cross that you're called to bear. That's not the cross that you're called to carry. The reason why I say that is because you didn't choose that. That was something that was laid on you. It was something that was put on you. 
And so I feel like that's actually a great time for the church to come in. That's actually a great time for Christians to come in. That's a great time for Jesus to come in and help carry the burden and make the burden easier and lighter. The cross that you are called to carry, though, the, the, the difference between that and some other things is, is that ultimately it's something that you choose. It's something that you choose that other people likely find foolish in order to try and follow Jesus more clearly and more plainly. And you may very well know what it means to pick up your cross. You, God may have spoken to you and shared his will with you. He may have told you. like He might have said, like, hey, what, I want you to sell all you have and give it to the poor. Everyone in this room would look at you like you were a fool. But Jesus would say, well done. Because that's what he wants for you, if that's what he's told you. Right? And so it could be anything. I mean, it could be any number of things that sound like that, and it might be very clear, it might be very plain, it doesn't mean it's easy. When God says something to you, he reveals his will to you, it doesn't mean it's easy to live it out. Just because you know what it is doesn't mean it's easy to live it out. And so that is, that's where the rubber meets the road. And we have to ask ourselves the question, and can we, like Jesus, do the will of God even when we know it's not easy, but when it's difficult? Can we walk into the will of God when, when it seems foolish? And that's when Peter pipes up and he says, Rabbi, Rabbi, does anyone else find the way he addresses Jesus as odd right here? In chapter 8, he called Jesus the what? The Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One, the Son of God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Put, put whatever name you want beside Messiah. And that's what he called Jesus a chapter ago. And now he's just rabbi? Maybe that's just what Peter called him and was used to calling him was rabbi. I, 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 that's likely. But... but I would think that what is happening in front of him right now, Jesus glowing like the sun, standing there with Moses and Elijah, would probably go, yeah, I probably shouldn't call him rabbi anymore. <laughs> He's clearly more than a rabbi, right? But then he says this. He says, it is good for us to be here. Really? Okay. Um, uh, that's... I don't know if that's true. Uh, let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for he, they were terrified. <laughs> so so he's, he, he, says, he says, Jesus, let us make some tents. Now, uh, what he's talking about here is actually he's referring to Jewish uh, intertestamental literature. Okay, it's a really hard word to say. Intertestamental literature. It's the literature uh, written in, from Jewish tradition that isn't found in our canon of Scripture. Uh, things like the Maccabees and, and things like that, right? That would have come from the same period of time as the Old Testament or the Old Testament prophets that these Jews likely would have read alongside of those things. And the reason why it's not in our Bible is because it tends to tell a little bit different of a story. It tends to have a little bit different picture of what the Messiah is going to be. And one of the key components to that was that the Messiah was going to be this warrior king who was going to come and he was going to overthrow the rest of the world and he was going to reign uh, and be kind of this political and military uh, leader. And so, uh, and so uh, there was this idea because Moses and Elijah never died that we know of. Right? I mean, like, all we see from Moses is he ascends up to the mountain to overlook the promised land. We don't hear of him dying. Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind and ascends to heaven. So the, the thought with, with a lot of these, a lot of these uh, people were that people, these great military leaders like Moses and Elijah, because Moses and Elijah were pretty good military leaders, too, if you didn't know. Like, they did, they did some damage as, as generals of God's army for a while. Um, and, and so they, um, they were thought like, oh, they're going to come back. They never die. They're going to come back. And the Messiah is going to uh, come, and, and he's going to rule and reign. And so this is the moment that Peter sees in his mind. Peter's seeing this in his mind, and he's like, this is the moment. This is the moment. And he goes, he goes, he goes guys, I didn't know what to say. Like, this was like, this is post-resurrection, right? Peter is post-resurrection, and he's looking at Mark, and he's telling this story, and he's like, Mark, dude, 
Like, I just saw all this stuff happening, and, like, Jesus' face was glowing. Like, I, I've never seen anything like it, and I was terrified. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I had no idea. So I was just like, hey, let's start a war. You know, like, uh, it, it, was, it was not his best moment, okay? Uh, but they, they, they believe that, like, building these tents is where they were going to launch this kind of, like, ar- like this is going to be base, home base, and they were going to launch this, this overthrowing of the nations from that spot. And so it's just, it's just clear, man, like he, he doesn't, I don't know, he didn't, no idea what to say. So he just says the first thing that he thinks is happening, right? Even though Jesus has said plainly, that's not what I'm about. He still doesn't get it. You see this, right? Then look at verse 7. It says, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him listen to him i think uh we should we should notice that the cloud always is representative of god in his presence all through the wilderness god leads the people of israel by cloud by day and fire by night and so this cloud comes and envelops jesus and moses and elijah and he says the same thing that he said in chapter one at his baptism he says this is my son in whom I love. Listen to him. He adds this, listen to him. The interesting thing is a lot of the other uh, transfiguration accounts actually, and, and at Jesus' baptism, there's another reference. This, this reference of, he, this is my beloved son whom I love, comes from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. It's a messianic psalm um, that, that is pointing to uh, the Messiah. And he, and he says, um, this is my son. A lot of times what we'll hear in these accounts is that uh, God also says, in whom I'm well pleased, which is a prophecy from Isaiah. Uh, but in this, there's actually an added line from Deuteronomy chapter 18, which is, listen to him. And Moses, as he was getting ready to depart the people and leave the people of Israel and be gone from them forever and hand them over to Joshua so Joshua could lead them from that point forward, he looks at the people and he says, there is going to be a prophet who is going to come who is like me. Listen to him. Listen to him. Jesus is that prophet who is like Moses who comes. And, and God is saying, listen to him I can only imagine what this means for Peter in his life it likely means for Peter that when Jesus says things that sound ridiculous like pick up your cross and follow me and listen to him and when Jesus says you're going to be a part of a failed revolution and you're going to die a cursed man's death you better listen to him and when Jesus looks at Peter and says before the rooster crows three times you're going to deny me You better listen to him. But also when he restores you after he is resurrected and he comes and he says, feed my sheep and feed my lambs, listen to him. And when he tells you to go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them, listen to him. But even for us today, right, this is something we need to take hold of. When you don't like something that Jesus has to say to you, listen to him. When you don't know what to say because Jesus is surprising you, don't say anything. Just listen to him. The reality is that his word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. It's his word that he spoke through Moses to deliver the law and what it looks like to love God and love others and what he used through the voice of Elijah to speak to his people. It is the word that he has used for centuries. We should be asking, have we been listening? It's the word that that started creation and spoke creation into existence, bringing light out of darkness. It is powerful, it is living, it is active, it is sharper than any double-edged sword. Listen to him. Verse eight says, and then suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. So they, 
they're, they're, like, they're in this like space of where this cloud comes down and says this, and I think that this is probably the moment that you're falling on your face, and, and so like then they kind of get up because they realize things have kind of calmed down a little bit, and they're looking around, and it's just Jesus there, just Jesus now. And this is a picture of how Jesus is the embodiment of all of this. That he is the embodiment of all that Moses was and all that Elijah was, but he's also the embodiment of the God of this cloud. And here he is. It's just him. It's just this amazing moment that hopefully all of us get to experience in our life where we begin to realize that it's all about him. That he is what everything is about. The way you do your job, it's about him. The way that you love your wife and raise your kids, it's about him. The way that you go about your day-to-day -day life as you interact with a cashier at the or your neighbor, when you see him in the neighborhood, it's about him. And when we can all finally get to this place of where we realize, man, it's all about him, and it's all focused on him. Everything that we are and everything that we're about, he's the only thing left. Man, I hope we can all get to that place where everything else is just kind of pushed away and he's all that's left and he's all that we see and he's all that we experience and take in and then he goes down the mountain with them and he charges them and says don't tell anyone what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. We talked about this idea of the Son of Man in uh, Daniel chapter 7 and how this is when Jesus dies on the cross and raises from the dead and ascends into heaven. This is the establishment of his kingdom over all nations and all people, every tribe, tongue, uh, and, and, and he is ruling and reigning. And so he's saying once that happens, once that kingdom is established, you can talk about this all you want, but wait until then. And they're confused. They're like, what is he talking about? This resurrection thing in verse 12, uh, I guess it's verse 10. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead might have meant. They were like, uh, what does this rising of the dead mean? I thought that like oh, we were all, like the Jews had this uh, thought process and still do have this thought process. And we should have this thought process too because I think it's still a thing. But, but they definitely thought that like it was all going to happen when the Messiah came. They thought that all the dead were going to rise, that all the righteous were going to be risen. This is the, the, the prophecy of the valley of dry bones that we see in Ezekiel. It's, it's this idea of, uh, of all, the, all the dead will rise, but we find out it's actually all the dead in Christ shall rise. Now there's going to come a day when all the dead in Christ will be raised with new resurrected bodies to live in the new heavens and to live in the new earth. And they thought, like, what is he talking about? Because if he's going to rise, is this going to happen? Is that... They're, can, they, can you see they still just don't get it? I mean, the very last thing that God said to them was listen to him. Jesus hadn't said anything yet. And then he says, hey, by the way, keep this to yourself until I rise again. And instead of going, okay, I guess we'll just like wait until he rises again. And then we'll do whatever he said. Like, instead of doing that uh, and listening, they're like questioning what he's saying. Do you see this? Sometimes it's hard to listen when what God said isn't what we expect. And then they ask him this question. Look at verse 11. Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Why do the scribes say first Elijah must come? I mean, can you be the Messiah if, if Elijah hasn't come yet? I mean, we just saw Elijah on the mountain. We just saw him on the mountain. I mean, how, how can you be the Messiah? You were here before. We saw him. We saw you. I don't, how is this possible? I mean, can you really be the Messiah? I mean, Malachi 4, 5, we're getting this right, Jesus, right? Malachi 4, 5 says Elijah has to come first. 
Do you see the question? You see what it's really going after? It's an attack on Jesus' identity. They're more concerned with the theology and it making sense in their head than they are just listening to him and following him and trusting him. And they're trying to figure out, like, are you really the Messiah? And I'm thinking, like, after what you just saw, you have the audacity to ask that question? Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, let me ask you, have you ever doubted him? Have you ever doubted what he can do? Have you ever doubted that he rose from the dead or that he wasn't just some normal guy? Have you ever doubted you ever doubted when things weren't really adding up the way you thought that they should? Have you ever doubted when his voice or his words sounded insane or crazy? Just plain hard? <laughs> you ever doubted that he has the power to heal? Sickness and disease? You ever doubt that he has the power to save? Because your sins are too great? You have the, ever doubt that he has the power to move mountains and part waters in the seas and make a way when there is no way? Have you ever doubted? I want you to know a couple things here. First, <laughs> if the inner three who got to be a part of some of Jesus' most amazing moments and spectacular accomplishments here on earth they saw all of that and then literally as they're walking down the mountain after seeing him glow and hang out with two guys we haven't seen in thousands of years and God come down in a cloud and say, this is my son. If they can doubt, you can too. You're in good company. <laughs> we all doubt. We all have doubts. You're not going to be able to, to walk through life without some doubt. However... Um, it's good to know that you're not alone in that but I think that there's a story here in this chapter that really helps us when we doubt and so I want to go to that story it's in chapter 9 verse 14 is where it starts I'm just going to read it and uh, we'll, we'll go through it here pretty quickly it says when they came to the disciples they saw a great cl cr crowd around him so they just come down from the mountain and there's a great crowd around them. The scribes are arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, greatly, um, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he had a spirit that makes him mute. And whatever it seizes, or whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, and he grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples if you could cast him out, but they were afraid, or they were not able. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I going to have to be with you? How long must I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and the spirit um, saw him immediately. It convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this happened? And he said, from childhood... It has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him, but if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said, if I can. <laughs> All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the crowd come uh, crowd came running together he rebuked the unclean spirit saying you mute and deaf spirit I command you come out of him and never enter him again and after crying out and convulsing him terribly it came out and the boy was like a corpse so most of them said he is dead but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose and when he had entered the house the disciples asked him privately why could we not cast it out 
And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So you see, the disciples, they can't cast out this demon out of this boy the father has brought to them. And Jesus' answer to them is because this kind only comes out through prayer. What is prayer? Other than our expression of belief and hope that God can actually intercede on our behalf and change things in our life. It is a faith-filled way of going to God and saying, God, I believe. I believe that you can do it all. I believe in who you are. I believe in what you can do. I believe in who you've said you are in your word. I believe in it all. And so I'm putting my hope, I'm putting my trust in you. That's what prayer is. It's amazing um, how easily, though, we give up on prayer. You know, I, we, we talk about how our elders get together every Wednesday night and pray a lot and invite you guys to write your prayer requests down. Uh, and, and, and it's great. I mean, we, we get prayer requests, you know, uh, a lot of weeks, and we'll pray over those. And there are weeks where we don't get any prayer requests, and we still find things to pray for, and we still spend time together praying. And here's the thing about that, is we've been doing this now for two and a half years, three years, something like that, where we've been getting together once a week to just pray together and pray over things in our church. And guys, we've seen prayer change things. We've seen prayer do things. Over a long period of time, very rarely have we ever like prayed something and then the next day we got like, hey, this miraculous transformation took place in this person's life. But very regularly as we've continued to go and go and go, and we've seen incremental changes and improvements as we've continued to stay faithful in prayer. We've seen God work. And so when you see God work, that gives you more faith, right? And that's why prayer is this, this aspect of belief because when you start to go believing and then you see God show up, you get more belief. You get more faith. And it helps kind of deal with some of that doubt that you have at times. But here's the other interesting thing. is this, this picture of this boy oppressed Jesus Jesus sets him free, right? And everyone's like, oh, he's, he's dead. But then Jesus touches him. And he lifted him up. And it says he arose. This is a, it's a really interesting story about how, man, Jesus is going to rise. When everybody thinks it's over, when everyone thinks it's hopeless, when everyone else has lost faith, when everyone else has lost belief, he just lift you up. He arose. It reminded me of that song I grew up singing when I was in church. He arose. He arose. He arose a victor from a dark domain and he reigns forever. The saints proclaim, he arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. And that's what he does for this little boy. He sets him free. And he lifts him up. And that's what he does for you. What he does for you on the cross, when he dies on the cross for your sins, he sets you free from the thing that no one else can set you free from. No other disciple can set you free from it. No other godly person, man, woman, or child can set you free from it. He sets you free from your sins. And he lifts you up that you might rise to be with him. That's what Jesus does. 
And that's the gospel hope that we have. Amen. So, if you're doubting, here's what I would say. Pray. And it doesn't have to be this big, long, elaborate prayer. It would just be, you know, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. That's one of the most beautiful prayers ever stated in Scripture. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. May we have enough belief and enough belief in Jesus and who he is to pray that prayer as we look at our doubts and face our doubts. All right, let's finish this section on the transfiguration, verses 12 and 13. It says, And he said to them, Elijah does come first, restores all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and he did to, th- to him, or they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So we don't get a glimpse into really the clarity behind what Jesus is saying in this account of the transfiguration. But in other accounts, it says, after the disciples asked this, and Jesus answered them and, and spoke. Um, of Elijah in this way the, the disciples their eyes were open to see that he was talking about John the Baptist that John the Baptist if you go back to Mark chapter 1 he, his, his prophecy was that he was going to prepare the way of the Lord that's the prophecy of Elijah the way that they describe uh, John the Baptist looking as one who wore camel skin and had crazy hair and all the things right that's that's a lot of the way Elijah was described. And so this idea of Elijah is seen in the person of John the Baptist who prepares the way for Jesus to be the Messiah. And that is what this section of Mark has been all about. It's been about confronting our doubts with who Jesus is when he says things that we can't grapple with or we can't comprehend or that are just plain hard to live out. When he says he's the Messiah, he's the Messiah, the Son of God, the law and the prophets, they all find their home in him. He is the image of the invisible God. That's what this is all about. And that's the whole premise of the book of Mark. If you go one verse one it says that this gospel is the gospel of jesus the messiah the son of god it's the whole premise of the whole gospel right in the middle we see jesus identity as clear as we've ever seen it and it is clear and there is no questioning it you cannot question his identity you cannot question his authority you cannot question his power you cannot question his plan or his will or his way you cannot question the Messiah and if you're fighting demons of doubt man pray pray until you can't pray anymore pray Believing that whatever's happening, whatever's going on, whatever issue you're dealing with, whatever's taking place, take it to Jesus in prayer. Just with a little bit of belief. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. That's all he needs. He just needs a little to move mountains and part waters. (laughs) Just a little bit of belief. Don't lose hope. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Messiah. Trust him in that. Believe and let him go to work in ways that maybe you never imagined he could.